Okay, people, thanks for coming. Today we have uh, Dan Bloomberg from the Google Book Search team to talk to us about document image analysis. Dan, take it away. Okay, thank you. Uh, yep. Let's see if this works. Okay, so this is a photo tech course. So what are we doing? What are we doing talking about image analysis? Well, I don't know, but but there was a lot more. Is 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 the uh, is the description actually? Actually, um, uh, a lot of uh, we, we can now capture uh, documents, for example, with cameras, and so it actually makes it makes sense to, to talk about this a little bit. Um, now, uh, image analysis in the uh, what I was just going to mention in the last century, image analysis was uh, tended to be a sort of AI-like uh, affair. Where, where people try to reason about images. And uh, you know, from my experience, uh, it, was, it was sort of funny because when I started in this field, uh, everybody else was working on 256 by 256 pixel images. And it didn't matter if it took them, took them a few minutes to find out, to reason about the image and get some result. I wanted to use document images, which were typically 8 million pixels. And I wanted a result in, in a, a few seconds. And I was, uh, I was actually impressed by uh, Douglas Hofstetter's statement that a human being can recognize a person in about 100 milliseconds. And so why can't we do, why can't we use kind of processing, image processing, or some kind of processing things rather than reasoning about, about an image? And there are other reasons too, um, but basically uh, virtually everything I do deals with, with the image. So the image is the primary representation. We don't, don't uh, don't really build up a lot of other things. Uh, there's, there's always a trade-off between speed and accuracy. It turns out that for image analysis, uh, you, can, you can sort of, you can, well, in a way, you can get rid of the, uh, you can have both. So you can have, you can do some things very, very quickly and get good results. Because in image analysis, you have to make decisions about, about pixels. And that's a uh, and that's a nonlinear process. So, uh, for example, uh, in image processing, you uh, you can scale, and you can have uh, uh, you can do linear interpolation or even higher order interpolation to try to get the most accurate uh, rendition of the scaled image, or uh, say in a color image, uh, for image analysis. Uh, very often you're working on binary images and you want to do something very crude and very fast. And so uh, uh, I'll mention this later, a rank order cascade of, of, uh, of power of two reductions uh, is, is actually very useful for doing such things. So and why, why are we talking about document image analysis? Uh, basically, I'm going to be talking about well, it it's, it's easier than natural scenes because there's more structure to it. Um, and it's very useful because we have a lot of paper and it's useful and we're, we live in a digital age. Um, it's also an interesting problem because unlike the graphics problem uh, where you've, you have a representation and you turn into a raster, in this case, the input is not well defined. In fact, the input can be just about anything, even though it's, it's supposed to have some kind of structure. So it's actually an inter interesting problem. So the roadmap, I'll talk a little bit about the goals, uh, what, what we try to do with, with image analysis, um, and then the approach that I take, uh, which is uh, use nonlinear operations, work with shape and texture, and, and always use the image. Uh, talk a bit about the primary tools, and then I'll give you some example applications. The primary tools are image morphology, affine transforms, counting, connected components, and seed fill. And I'll just be showing you the, some, some set of, of, of applications here. So, so the goals. OK, so first of all, uh, we're trying to extract information from the page. And you can just kind of imagine what that is. You, you want some kind of global information uh, about, for example, the skew of the image, text orientation, uh, or if, it, if there's some kind of warping. With a, with a camera, you can get warping. Um, uh, you want to know what's on the page. So what are the components? What's the hierarchical arrangements? Where are they specifically? Um, and sometimes you want to know what the equivalence classes are. That's useful for compression. And you want to know things about the photometry, too. 
Uh, you actually want to know a lot. I've just mentioned, you know, like what's the background color? Is there color? So uh, you, you will typically want to do some improvement or restoration of the image, or you may, you may not. Um, but if you do, uh, there, there are geometrical uh, operations that you can do in terms of de-skewing and de-warping. Uh, there are various color mapping things you can do to restore uh, the image because of uh, non-uniform uh, lighting, for example. Um, you may want to improve the readability, so you want to increase the contrast of the text. Um, you may want to improve the way the images look by, by uh, increasing the dynamic range, for example, of the images. Um, if you, if the image has been scanned at too low resolution below the Nyquist limit, you're going to get more array. Uh, with, with digital cameras, with, with the Bayer pattern, this often leads to uh, color. Uh, either coming, so, and, and uh, that's, it's useful to detect that. If you do detect it, you probably don't want to do a normal demosaic, and you probably just want to, to uh, well, depending on if, if the image has color or not. Uh, if the image doesn't have color and you have the color moray, you, you just want to uh, demosaic. You want to um, just basically remove, effectively remove the filters over the over the sensors. Uh, and then there are a whole bunch of other things that you may want to do. So if you have binary scans, you may want to remove noise. And I'll show you a kind of a weird way of doing that a little later. Um, typically, you have some bleed through. That's that's good to get rid of if you can. Um, if you're going to display something and it's binary, uh, it's useful to, to crunch it down and, and, and into a gray image so that it looks good on a grayscale display. If you're going to print something and you have a gray input, you typically want to expand it up uh, and do that in a way that preserves some of the, anti, some of the, 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 the gray Im information around the edges of the characters, for example. And you uh, may want to do quantization uh, for compression. So, uh, so in in uh, in these images, if you have JPEG, for example, you, 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 I'm sure you've all seen that you have artifacts uh, around the, the text, the the eight by eight block artifacts. Uh, as I mentioned before, you can have uh, moray on half tones and on gravure, and it looks very different, but it's it's, uh, it's still kind of ugly. Um, and, uh, and, of course, and if you have uh, thresholding, uh, that, can, that can do, um, if, you, if you do binary thresholding, you can destroy images. Um, and, uh, okay, so there are, there are various techniques for avoiding these problems. Um, so the, the, the JPEG uh, artifacts, if you, can, if you can get a uniform background, you can get rid of that, those, those uh, ugly things. Um, yeah, well, so let me just, let me just go on uh, and talk about how we're gonna, how we're gonna do this, excuse me. Um, and please, please stop me if you have any questions at all. Um, so, uh, as I said, the approach requires nonlinear operations because you need to make decisions on each pixel. If you have linear operations, you basically don't make decisions. Um, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be uh, uh, assigning labels to pixels. They'll be implicit, uh, but it, uh, any pixel could have a multiplicity of labels. And one way to think of assigning labels to pixels is to have, uh, to have mass. And so you're gonna have, you can imagine uh, a binary mask where uh, a set of masks where each mask represents a particular kind of label and then and then that mask gives tells you which pixels have that label um, and typically uh, the approach is bottom up aggregation of, of information uh, that is pixels telling other pixels what's around them and and what they should do um, so uh, the approach is, is basically working with shape and texture. Shape and tex texture is ill-defined. Shape is everybody knows. Uh, but you can think of uh, texture, texture at, uh, at a particular scale. Um, 
So for example, if you have a line of text, uh, if you're up close, you can see the characters. If you get very far away, it just looks like sort of a fuzzy line. So, so, and it looks like a set of fuzzy lines. So the texture of the characters blurs into, into something that's uniform, but then you've got, you have, the, uh, you have the lines separated. So that's a texture. So depending on the scale you want to look at, um, things that are that texture at a at a higher resolu at a higher resolution look more like shapes at a at a coarser resolution. Um, so we're going to use binary morphology to 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 sieve to to basically extract uh, texture or shape components out. And as I mentioned, we, the, the rank reductions are, are very interesting because they allow you to modify the texture at the same time as that you change the scale. Um, and uh, <coughs> seed fill, is a, is a, which the French call binary reconstruction, is a very interesting way to make a robust kind of segmentation. You basically have a situation where you have, you have a seed and a mask. The seed pixels, you're pretty sure that those seed pixels are, are correct. Like this seed pixel is inside a halftone image part. OK. The mask, the mask pixels, you don't, really, you don't really know what they are. The only thing that you can pretty, pretty carefully assert is that pixels of different types are not touching each other. And therefore, if you start with a seed, you can fill into, the, into this mask. So if you start with halftone seeds, you can just get the halftone regions. That's, that's a, it's a useful. Uh, way to do it. And it's a very typical way of doing segmentation. The image is primary representation. Okay, that's where the information is. Just, just use it. And, uh, and so, in fact, uh, you know, my view is use, use image processing to do just about everything. Um, if you want to use other representations, things get complicated, uh, and and it's relatively limiting because because how much can you how much can you do on some representation that you've made up to describe the image, like a level set, <clears throat> level set for example. Whereas if you use the the image, uh, things are relatively simple, and they're and they're generalizable, and it's easy to visualize. So that's the approach, the tools. Okay, so. Um, I'm going to go through the, the tools kind of fast. How many of you are familiar with image morphology? OK, OK. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just sort of say a bit about it. Uh, there, there are a lot of references that, that, that are available here that you can get more details. Um, so basically, uh, morphology is a way of extracting, as I said, shape and texture, sieving, for example. Uh, the basic operations are dilation and erosion. The analogy is with convolution, which, which you're all familiar with. In convolution, you have a kernel, and you basically do a, uh, an averaging uh, with, a, a, with the kernel, the averaging of the pixels under the kernel. It's really a convolution. You're multiplying by the, the kernel value for every single pixel in the image. Uh, in morphology, what you do is you've got a kernel, which is called a structuring element. And instead of doing an averaging, you do a nonlinear operation. You take a min or a max. So it's basically a rank order filter where the rank is either at the minimum or the maximum. And that's all it is. And you'd have to, it's an image processing operation. So for every pixel, so every pixel in the image, you're going to compute a pixel in the source. You're going to compute a pixel in the destination. Uh, and the structuring element is composed of, of hits don't cares, also misses. You can specify. So, so uh, let's, let's think of this as uh, on, a, on a binary image. Um, you can say, these, these pixels must be in the foreground hits. These, these pixels in the image must be in the background, so they're misses. And it, there's also an origin to the structuring element. The origin says, says where you put the pixel in the destination when you've made your decision in the source. Opening and closing are idempotent operations, so they're, they're pure filters. Uh, an opening is an erosion followed by a, by, a by a dilation. And closing is vice versa. They're, they're, these are dual operations, just as the erosion and, and dilation are duals. Um, which what, is, what is erosion and dilation? Yeah, right. Uh, let's see, was I going to do that next? All right, sorry. Uh, yes. Uh, so, so an erosion is, is what you do is you've got this kernel, 
and you put it on the image. And you have to place it at every point on the image. And you just, you just ask, uh, what's the minimum of all the pixels that it's sitting over at each place? So if it's a binary image uh, and you just have hits, then the minimum, if, if every, every pixel in the, in the structuring element is over a foreground pixel, then the minimum is, is the foreground, which is, in binary images, it's a 1. So however, if any of the pixels is over a background, then the minimum is a 0. Okay. So, so if, if the thing fits entirely over the foreground, you're going to get a pixel in the destination, a 1 in the destination. Otherwise, you get a 0 in the destination. So if you have a, a structuring element that's a, a line, for example, and you're putting it on, anywhere it fits, you get something. Anywhere it doesn't, you don't. So if you have, if you have a, a thin line in the image that's narrower than the size of the structuring element, that line's going to disappear because there's no place you can put it on. Okay, the dilation is the, is the dual of the erosion. In that case, you place the structuring element on the image, uh, and <coughs> effectively, you can place it on the, so that the origin is, is on, the, uh, on the foreground pixels. And what it will do is it will draw into the, into the destination image, it will draw itself. It draws itself in there. So it, it effectively widens, it will widen the, the uh, any, any structure that's in the source image by its width. And that's why it's called a dilation. The, so at, for example, the opening is an erosion followed by a dilation. If you think about what ha that happens is the erosion brings it down, right? So you, you, let's say you've got a line that's three, three wide. You put it in the image. Now, you've got a, now you just have a single point for every point that was in that line, OK? When you do the dilation, it, it, you basically open the result back up again. And so the, 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 the net effect is that when you do an opening, uh, you, you place the, any place that you can place the structuring element within the foreground, you, get, you paint that structuring element exactly as it is, uh, exactly where it was in the source into the destination, OK? So anywhere it can fit, you get it. And that's kind of nice, because um, what, it, what it means is that it, it leaves things that are smaller than the structuring element pretty much invariant, and think, uh, uh, larger pretty much invariant. And things that are smaller, um, it, it removes them. So that's why it's a filter. That's why you can think of it as a filter. In fact, it was invented by the, the French for doing filtering on, on images that had particles. Is that, is that OK? And the, the, uh, the hit miss, as I said, is a, is a, a general pattern match. Uh, so these are, these are examples of hit miss structuring elements that are used to identify character ascenders and descenders. So uh, what you have here, so these are hits. The blacks are hits. The whites are don't cares. And the, the things with circles in them are, are misses. The origin is that guy right there with a little dot. Okay, so anywhere that this whole thing fits, that is, these are all hits. The don't cares you don't ask questions about, and these these uh, six are misses. You're going to get in the destination. You get one pixel right there. Okay, so what happens is it turns out there are more ascenders and descenders in in text in Roman alphabets, generally. So if you do this and then you count up. You do this on the image. And actually, there's some, there's some filtering that you can do to make it a little more robust before you actually count, you know, apply this operation to the image to count the ascenders and descenders. So you do this, and you just count up how much you get when you use these two for the ascenders and these two for the descenders. And basically, based on that difference, you can decide if the text is up or down, if there's enough of it. So that's, that's, and that's, a, that's what the hit miss structuring element does. Um, so uh, how, how is it implemented? Well, um, so efficiently, in order to implement it efficiently, you have to use packed words. So, the, so you're, if you're, you're dealing with binary images, they're packed 32 pixels, 32 bits uh, in, in a 32-bit word, or 64 if you've got that. Conceptually, uh, what you're going to do is, you're, as, I, as I mentioned, you just test the structuring element at each point. You make a, and you write it out over there. That's, that's not the way you want to do it, obviously, right? Because you want to do it on, on a word, 
word parallel basis. So in fact, uh, what you can do is you can just use raster ops. How many of you are familiar with, are familiar with raster ops? OK, the, the raster op is a basic operation which, is, which takes a, a block, a rectangular block of an image, uh, and it does, it, it does an operation with another rectangular block of another, with, with, a, with a rectangular block of another image, let's say in place on this other image. And the, and the operation can be, uh, let's say, any logical operation. And there are 14 different logical operations that you can do between these blocks. So um, it's a, it's, uh, if you want to paint characters on a screen, use raster ops. In fact, that was I, possibly the first uh, application that I knew of where it was, where it was implemented. Um, so with a raster op, basically what you're going to do uh, is you're going to take the whole image, and depending on the structuring element tells you, tells you what you're going to do with it. So suppose you want to do a, a dilation uh, with, a, with a three by one. So what it says is, you take the image, you start out with the image, paint it to the destination, okay? Then you take the, the same image, and see the structural element has, it says, you, the, let's say the origin is in the center, so that you've got one on one side and one hit right, one pixel to the other side. So you just paint it again, shift it over by one to the left, to your left, and then paint it again, shift it over by one to the right, okay? And each time you paint it, when I say paint it, I mean you or it. So, so the, the OR is basically this max operation in, on a binary image, this Boolean max. If you're, if you're doing an erosion, you would, you would paint it, and then you would do AND. You would shift it and AND, shift it and AND. And you gotta be careful which way you shift in order to make them dual. But basically, that's, that's all that you do. So it's just AND, it's just logical. Logic. And, and so the raster op is implemented 32 bits at a time. So it's relatively fast, OK? Um, what, what, else, what else can you do? Uh, for the typically, 95% of the time that you ever use this thing, you're going to be using what, what I call brick structuring elements. So it's just solid, you know, solid horizontal, solid vertical, solid rectangular, OK? So for those, um, it's, uh, they're separable in x and y. So, so that's good. So you, can do, you do the x and then the y after you've done the x, right? Uh, and then, and they're also uh, composable as sequences at different scales. So if you, you can do a two-way composable thing, suppose you have something that's 100, well you can do, first you do 10, and then you do another one where you have a comb, where you have a hit at every 10. And so it, it takes this thing that you've already dilated by 10, and it just moves it over 10, 10, 10. So you've only got, so it's only 20, so it's like, Two times the square root of the size is the number, and you can go on with this thing, right? You could do it three-way, and then it's going to be three times the cube root, and you can take it, you know, until until you uh, until it becomes ridiculous. But so so there are various ways of speeding it up. Uh, now you can also implement it faster than raster ops by unrolling the loops. And what you do, the destination word method, you basically you write code specific for that structuring element that says for each destination, 32-bit word or 64-bit word, uh, the structuring element tells me that if I'm doing an erosion, I have to take pixels from these, these, other, these words, ship them in, mask them appropriately, and then I get the result. So you unroll the loop, and it's about four times as fast. And uh, it's really, really ugly to write the code and to get it right. Um, so you don't have to with with Leptonica. It will auto auto gen all the code for you, so that that makes it a bit easier. Um, and Leptonica also lets you invoke these these bricks with an interpreter, so you can invoke them as a sequence of operations. I think you'll see an example of that later. Okay. So any questions about that? So that's that's how it's implemented. Now uh, more toolkits. Uh, so we have affine transforms. You're familiar with this in, in graphics. Affines are translations, shears, um, rotations, and scaling. Uh, the uh, rotation can be done uh, on, a, on a digital image either with two or three shears. And it can also, and so for example, and that can be, that's, that's depth independent. 
um, and that's done by Rasterop. And one of the, the nice things about Rasterop, I, I described it in, in the context of binary images. Rasterop uh, obviously works on images of all depths. So that, that's a, it's a nice feature that you don't need to worry about the depth. Um, if you have a, uh, let's say, a grayscale image or a color image and you want to do a nice job, then you have to, then you can use area mapping or you can even get more fancy and use cubic uh, splines and things like that. Generally not necessary to go anything beyond, beyond linear interpolation, which is equivalent to area mapping for, for, uh, for the rotation. Scaling, scaling is quite complicated because there's so many cases and so many different ways of doing it. Um, and again, there's references for a huge set of different things that you can do with it. Now, they're useful for many things. So they're useful for rendering. In, in rendering, um, you will, you'll typically, if you're going up in resolution, you're go, you want to do some kind of interpolation. If you're going down, you want to use some kind of smoothing and subsampling, some anti-aliased operation for going down. Um, you, uh, uh, you may want to combine it with depth change, so a scale to gray. For example, if you have a binary image and you want to display it on a, on a, on a screen, you do not want to display it as a binary image. You want to display it as a color or a, gray, a grayscale image. Um, and, uh, and likewise, if you're, if you're going to print something and you have it as a, as a gray image, printing is, a, is, is typically a binary operation, so you would scale it up with linear interpolation and then get an accurate, a more accurate binary rendition using the, ali the anti-alias information on the edge of the characters. Uh, and you can combine morphology with subsampling and there are uh, a couple of ways to do that. You can do it in the binary regime, you can also do it in the grayscale regime. Um, in, the, in the binary regime in particular, you get this textural filtering effect which, which We'll see an example of. And this, these are just examples. I won't, I won't go through this in detail, but, but you know, in terms of, of the kinds of scaling. I will, do want to mention the binary to binary with this rank order. Uh, so in other words, what, what happens is you may, you may want to work at a lower resolution. The question is, how do you get there? Uh, you may want to work, say, 8x down, because of the scale of what you're looking at. How do you get there? Uh, you could subsample, but what you might, in fact, want to do is you might want to do, let's say, a, a morphological um, erosion uh, and, then, and then do the subsampling afterwards. That's a, huge, that's a wasteful effort, even though morphology is now pretty fast. What you, what you can, however, do is you can combine the two together. And that's by doing a cascade of 2x reduction. So you, each 2 by 2 uh, can have anywhere between 1 and 4 foreground pixels in it. And so you can just basically say, I'm, gonna, I'm going to do a rank order reduction. If it's got n or more pixels in the foreground, I want a pixel on that reduced image. Okay, and you can do that essentially at the, at the, the same speed that you would do straight subsampling. You can do that in a parallel, parallel way across the thing. So we're talking, in that case, we're talking about one, about one millisecond uh, to take a full eight million pixel image and generate and generate the, the, the reduced image at any scale that you want, at any scale that you want with any sequence of these, of these ranks. So it's actually a very useful technique. It was useful quite a few years ago and it's still useful. Um, so let's go on. Uh, another piece in the toolkit is, is counting, uh, just counting foreground pixels, also uh, computing uh, connected components. Uh, I, I said something about how you should stay in the image. Well, every once in a while you have to leave the image and get, gather some information about the image. So this is, this is the exception that I make, well, the main exception. Um, counting pixels, uh, you might want to test for foreground pixels uh, and for skew detection uh, and, and measurement, uh, you basically you need to sum the pixels on raster, raster lines. Uh, connected components are useful for labeling components. Um, and, uh, okay, um, another counting thing is histograms, right? So you may want to take histograms of 8-bit eight, eight, uh, eight per pixel images. 
Um, so, okay. All right. Uh, so another another tool, the seed fill. I mentioned seed fill, right? You got you have a seed and a mask, and you just fill it in. Okay. Um, slow method would be morphological, and uh, and you don't want to do that because that takes the number of iterations equal to the size of the component that you're trying to fill. Uh, much faster is to use a sequential method. Uh, at first, I first saw it, uh, Luke Vincent, who's here, uh, came up with this thing. Raster, raster, anti-raster on again on on forward 32-bit words, um, and you just have to do some number of them until it until it converges. So, uh, so you can do seed fill very very quickly, um, and and yeah, the the other thing to mention is that that in Leptonica it actually uses a uh, seed fill method by Heckbert, which is which is relatively efficient. To label the, to find the connected components, to identify the connected components, to find where the bounding boxes are for them, to actually find the images of the separate connecting components. Um, and there's also a grayscale version of seed fill. It's, it's a little, little weird to think about how, to, how you what, what it means if you have a grayscale image, which is think of it as some some arbitrary topology, some height in, in two dimensions. But what you're what you're essentially doing is you're You've got you've got some seed at some point. Now the seed itself is also a gray image, and it just kind of fills out until it hits the boundaries. So it can't get any further, right? It fills out until it so it's clipped by this by the the mass. The mask is typically higher, okay? And then it just kind of follows the contour. And when it's able gets under, you know, there's a little uh, saddle or something. It's able to, and it just sort of sneaks out and goes on like that. And it keeps going like that. It's, it's actually uh, very useful. There's something called an H-dome operation where, where you can, uh, I'll tell you exactly what you do. You take, a, you take a, uh, an image. What you want to do is find out, tell me all the peaks, all the peaks in the image that are, uh, that are, <laughs> that are not larger than a certain height. So you take the image, you subtract that height from the image, and the thing that you subtracted is the seed. Then you do this seed fill operation, and after you fill the seed, uh, basically you don't fill into the into these height the height parts, right? You don't fill into the into the the parts that are higher, and then you just uh, subtract the seed the, the the seed after it's been filled from what you had before, and you end up with with these with the peaks. So it's a way of of normalizing out background, and it's a different way from grayscale. Uh, morphology, which the grayscale closing, which I will show you in a minute. All right, uh, and I'm going to just, just run right through this. The, so the Leptonica library has, just has a whole bunch of stuff. That's all you need to know, but it's available in a, in a, in a variety of places. Um, uh, it's open source. It has a very small number of structs. Um, and it's, uh, so the, the, these operations, we've, we've already mentioned them, it also has has a bunch of other things. It has I.O. For in the standard formats so that you can actually do something useful. And it has a whole bunch of applications. And we're gonna, we'll look at a, a few, just a few today. Okay, so there are things that you can do. It's basically a low-level pixel grinding library, but you know there are a few simple op, uh, applications that you can make from them. Okay, and so let's get right into that. So the first one, page segmentation. Uh, and this is uh, this image is is from the University of Washington data set. Thanks to uh, is that right? UNLV. UNL sorry UNLV uh, data set. Thanks to Ray. Uh, so so there's an image, and you, what you want to do is you want to find the half tones, the text lines, etc. Okay, so uh, you just you just do a bunch of operations, right? And so you do that, and then you do that, and you're done. Okay. Well, all right. So. I'll show you in a little more detail what, what you're actually doing. First, the first one is that's that's the image you start out with. This is the seed image for the for the halftone. So these are the pixels that you're pretty sure are in, in a halftone part, right? This is a is the mass that you're going to fill. This this thing is basically a dilated version of that. Okay, you want to make sure that you that that in the halftone regions, if they exist. The pixels are going to be touching, so that any seed you have is going to fill out all of them. So you have to do a little bit of dilation. Okay, 
And then when you do the seed fill, you get this. That's nice. And you can take it out and you get that. And then what you want to do is you want to find the text lines, let's say. So you can do this. You can do a basically a, um, a closing, a horizontal closing operation, which is going to smear them out. Uh, but if you do that, then you're going to join the columns. So before you do that, you do a very large vertical opening to get rid of the, uh, to, to on the, uh, you do a large vertical opening on the inverse image to get the white space, the vertical white space. And then that, this thing right here is you actually remove some more pixels, and I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. So you actually use this on that to get this right there. And then you can join up the text blocks and, and see the different parts. Uh, so let's 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 look at just in a just so that you can see you know there's nothing there's nothing really terribly hidden or difficult about this. This is this this cascade of reductions. We're going to do it at eight x reduction. We don't need to know about these seeds at a very high resolution. So we do this cascade. Those that's the level that when it says it's a four, what that's saying is for every two by two, all four of them have to be on or it's gone. Well, what that does that that thins things out. That's an erosion. An eroding process. So when you do this cascade, you're basically, it's like you were doing a big morphological erosion and then you were doing a subsampling. Uh, and then, then there's a, uh, a, small, a small opening to get rid of, of, uh, of some noise, just accidental noise. And uh, you, know, you could have something elsewhere. And, uh, and then that's it. OK. That's the result. Um, yeah, this was, this was expanding it back up. Uh, th this op all these operations took place at about 150 pixels per inch. Um, I mean, sorry, the, the, the input was 150 pixels per inch. The 8x reduction is, is 8x below that. All right, so that was, that's the seed. This, uh, to get this, I actually used a close, a closing operation to get the, the mask. Uh, the seed fill is just seed fill, OK? And, uh, and again, there's a little bit of an opening to get rid of uh, small lines and things like that. But basically, this is what you end up with. So this is the half, this is the half tone mass. Uh, then, then the rest of it, you just subtract that off. Right? It's just set subtraction. Uh, and so that's, that's the rest of it. To get the text line, oh, this is, this is, so now we do the inversion. We take the inverse of that thing, and then we do this, this uh, basically a vertical, there's a, there's a little, Right there, uh, you do a little horizontal opening and then a very large vertical opening. It's 200. That means you have to do, if you did this, if you did this with a, uh, just with a block thing, you'd have to do 200 of them. You can do it in a, a composite fashion, and it's about, about 40 operations, 35 operations. So it doesn't take much time. So then, but then here, here's the problem. The problem is, if you do this, uh, you can have white space above text, and and so you'll have you'll have something that's 200 long, and it'll go right through, and it'll go right through into into, into a, a space between text. So it'll actually break up something that you don't want it to break up, right? We really want this to break up things between columns. We don't want it to come shooting down from the from the top or up from the bottom, and and just fortuitously sneak through a whole bunch of stuff. So what we do is we do we remove some of these pixels. And the ones that we remove, uh, we basically take a, we, we start out with that, that, that inverse image, and we say, where are the things that are at least 80 by 60 black pixels, right? So all the things that are 80 by 60, that's going to be this, this stuff at the top and the bottom. Anything that's that big, let's find it, and let's subtract it out. Let's remove it. And so when we do that, we get this. So it went from this to that, OK? So this is now a reasonable thing to use. Oh, this is now a reasonable thing to use. Uh, so now we've closed this. We, that's a 30, 30 width closing, and then we and then we remove it. Right? We just subtract that that thing off. Okay. So now we've we've, we've opened it back up, and the rest of it you can just label the the colors. That just shows you. You have to do a few more lines of code in order to label the colors, but it's not much. Okay, 
Uh, so here's here's a uh, here's a different example, and this is this is uh, this is kind of funny. You probably all received a photocopy of something uh, that's that where the the copier just got really weird with the thresholding, and it it gives you a lot of really dark stuff. So let me like that over there. This is uh, Ashok's one of Ashok's uh, favorite papers, actually, I believe. <laughs> But uh, but the problem is that it's it's really horrible. So how do you get rid how do you get rid of all that noise, right? Well, you could scan it in binary and try to clean it, but you could also scan it in in grayscale and try to clean it as a grayscale image. And one simple way of cleaning it as a grayscale image is to try to figure out what the background is. Well, so there's the background. How do we get the background? We got the background just by taking that foreground. Did I, did I show that? No. Yeah. And we just do a closing. We do a morphological closing, uh, not, even a, not even a particularly large one, just big enough, big enough to get rid of the text. What does the closing do? The closing gives you a, remember, the closing gives you a max. So the closing is going to, uh, and, and in, in grayscale images, black is low. Black is zero, right? So the background is the higher, is the higher stuff. So you're just going to run this thing over and get the max. And so that's all you do. You just pick something that's big enough to get rid of the text, and you get that. Now, uh, there's an, uh, one other thing you have to, if you do that, the result you get is not quite as smooth as what you, you would see there. What you actually get, you'll see the blocks where the, where the, the, uh, the structuring element was sort of stuck. You know, I mean, it, 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 the noise in the image, there's, there's various noises in the image that, that gives it a blocky. So what, what you can do is just do a, a convolution, just do a regular convolution. Uh, that's actually a 30 by 30 convolution. It looks like 15, but it's really 30 by 30. So it's about three times the size of that. And, that, and that's what gives you this nice, smooth uh, gray curve, which is the background. Once you have the background, uh, it's relatively simple to uh, figure out how to, how to uh, threshold, uh, adaptively threshold that, that image. And I just want to mention, this little guy right here, scale gray min max. So this is a this is an El Cheapo way of doing the same thing as the closing. Basically, uh, since since um, the background is is you don't need to have the background at every single pixel. When you do the morphological closing, you're getting the background at every pixel. You don't need that. You you just need it sort of. I need to know it, you know, every 10, 20 pixels. So. Well, why not do that? Why not just tile the thing up and do a, uh, do a min, in this case, do a max over each of those, those things? And, and you get roughly the same result. And it's probably about 20 times faster. It's 20 times faster than the, than, than the closing. And the closing itself is very fast be, due to an algorithm uh, by um, Gil uh, Verman and, and Van Herrick from, from 1991, surprisingly late, where they figured out how to do this operation, how to do a closing or an opening or an erosion or a dilation in grayscale in a time that's independent of the size of the structuring element for a structuring element that's a brick. Okay, so anyway, uh, there, there, one, of the, one of the lessons is there are always these, these uh, faster things that you can do that give you the information that you need, almost always. Okay, um, so, Okay, skew. How are we doing? Well, I'm running out of time. Okay, uh, let me just, I'll talk really fast. Deskewing an image is, is a useful thing to do. There are hundreds of papers on this, maybe thousands of papers, okay? Now, the, now, when there are hundreds of thousands of papers, you can either say the problem is not solved and they keep working on it, or the problem is so easy that people can just find new ways of doing it and they're just writing, you know, printing stuff on paper. So. Uh, it's really the latter. The, uh, the most robust met method that's known was, was found uh, nearly 20 years ago uh, by a guy named Postal. And basically what you do is you just, okay, uh, here's the, here, the naive idea is, well, if the thing is, is properly de-skewed and I sum, I sum the pixels on each scan line, some scan lines will have lots of pixels and some will have very few, okay? That's the naive idea. So. Uh, what I, I just do a vertical shear until I get this, until I get the, the biggest 
difference between them, right? So it's like some of them have few, some of them have many. That's a variance. You can just basically, it's, you can, it's equivalent to the, to the sum of the squares of the pixels on the, on the scan line. There's a, there's a constant difference which is independent of the skew. So, so that's, that's the, that's the and, that, and that kind of works sometimes, but it fails in the following situation. When you have multiple columns and the text is not aligned on the multiple columns, uh, and the fact that the text is kind of arbitrarily aligned, then this whole thing washes out and it doesn't work. But the thing that Postal realized worked was Oh, even if you have multiple columns, what, what, what you, instead of getting all that energy from the scan line itself, get the energy just from the transition at the bottom and the top of the, of the, the baseline and the top of the X site. So, so take the difference in the, in the number of pixels on, on adjacent scan lines and take the variance of that. Okay, so here's, so that's basically it. Um, and you can typically compute this at a resolution of about 100 pixels per inch which gives you an accuracy of roughly, the theoretical accuracy is roughly one pixel vertical out of the width of the image, uh, which is about a, a 20th of a degree, and which is much better than what people would notice, so that's fine. You don't need to go any further than that. This operation on a computer today takes, uh, you know, probably, it takes less than a tenth of a second to, uh, to figure that out. Um, now, on this image right here, so I purposely picked a, a nasty one, because this one has two columns and they're, and they're all different. And what you get, you, this, so this is, the, this is the score function, it's a function of angle, so there's the angle, and the, the thing is, uh, uh, is, is, that, is that where it is? I guess it's there, yeah. Um, so it's a max, it's not really peaked, okay? If you, have, if you have a single column, this thing is extremely, extremely narrowly peaked. Uh, this is this is kind of wide. The width is about 0 0.5, 0 0.05, um, but it doesn't matter what you choose in there. Uh, so this is that's basically what happens. Okay. Uh, now, uh, if you take a picture with a camera, a uh, little camera, you're going to get some keystoning, right? If you're close to it, so you you have this this uh, non affine transformation. You can actually, uh, in a very simple way, uh, fix, fix that. So basically what you do is you have to, you have to de -skew it, use the same method I just showed you, break it up into, into slices, compute the, uh, the skew in each slice, okay? So there's the skew, fit a line to it, and that gives you, that gives you, uh, that gives you your best approximation to what the, what the projective transformation is that you need in order to uh, to de-skew it? Um, let's see. Oh yeah, and so so then you, so you de-skew it, and then the this the second thing that this this shows you is once you've got it de-skewed, uh, you can find the baselines. It's relatively simple to find baselines, and well there, there's an example of where the baselines are. You can see them there. So you would, you would have actually had a lot of trouble if you tried to do that operation on this keystone image. Um, but what's nice is once you've got, once you've got the, uh, the thing properly de-warped, uh, then each, effectively each line is giving information uh, to the others about, about where it is. Because you, 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 don't, have to, you don't have to fit both the, the, the position and the slope, right? You, all you have to do is fit the Y position. To each one. How do you break this into blocks? Huh? Uh, in what way do you break this into blocks to, to do this? Do you tie all the blocks for the Oh, okay. The question is in what way do, do we break it into blocks? Uh, do you just, no, just, yeah, just uh, do something arbitrary. Have, have, you have some rule that you're going to take 20, 20 pixel high, uh, 200 pixel high blocks, um, and they're going to be overlapping of a certain size and just do it. Yeah, something something like that. Full width, or? full width. Yeah, take take the full width. Take take the data you've got. When you when you've got, yeah yeah. In fact, uh, yeah. In this, you want you want to use all the data. You probably you don't want to do this at a reduced resolution because you don't have that many lines in each. I, I just don't see how this picks up keystone. If you have a Star Wars uh, opening credits effect, then yes. everything is horizontal to begin with, but it's keystone. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, 
So, um, so the question is, 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 can you take out a general keystone uh, with, this, with this operation? And the answer is, the answer is you can take out the, uh, the horizontal, uh, the, the part that, you can make the parts horizontal if they're not. Uh, to, to, to deal with the parts that are, are the, the vertical keystoning, right? No, you can't do that. That's right. So you can only get rid of, you can only do part of it. You're, you're, that's, that's completely right. Uh, if it's just, <laughs> so yeah, you can, you could, you could, if, if you think it's justified, then you can, then you can do a, another projective transformation to, uh, to get rid of that. Uh, so here's another application. I won't go into this, but basically, if you can find the connected components, you can do an unsupervised classification of those components. And, uh, and in fact, uh, Adam Langley uh, wrote a JBIG2 encoder, which Ashok mentioned uh, is how you, how you can compress binary images very, very well because you're using, it's a lossy compression with a, with a representative for each of the equivalence classes. Um, I'll just run through this thing in one minute. Do I have one minute? Sure. Uh, so color quantization, color segmentation. Uh, well, they, 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 they can kind of go together. Uh, and you know, why color quantization? Because it's, it, it's fun. Um, uh, actually, there, there are good things you can do with it. But what I'm gonna, just going to show you is, is I'm going to talk about an uh, Occube uh, way of doing the quantization. This is, I, I, just, I just mentioned uh, su unsupervised uh, classification of shape components. So here, in this case, we're doing a, a essentially a clustering uh, in a three-dimensional space of the, of the colors that appear in, a, in an image, a natural image. Okay. And how you do that clustering, you, there are many ways of doing it. Occube is really nice uh, because it, it has depth, so you can, you can choose at what level you're going to select um, to, to go down to for any particular cluster. Turns out you don't have to get too fancy, though. Dithering, dithering gives you better accuracy. But it, it makes the, uh, the mean squared error worse, but it looks, looks better. Um, and you may also want to use quantization if you, for example, if you have to scale something that's got a color map, you have to remove the color map to do a decent scaling. You may want to use the same color map at the end. So, so we take that image. So this, these, are, these are examples. You can have fixed levels. Uh, you can say, I'm going to go down two levels in the Oc cube. Uh, 64 things, and and uh, what we find with this thing is there 27 colors. That doesn't look great. Uh, if you go down three, you get this one. Still doesn't look great. Okay. Uh, well, another thing you can do is you can have uh, you can just say, okay, I'm going to use 256 cells. I'm going to go three, three, two, two for the blue because we don't see blue that well. <clears throat> And I'm just going to find the, uh, <coughs> the closest ones. In that case, you get 56 colors there. But if you dither it, so the, and dithering is just an error diffusion dithering where you add the, the residual to the, to the next one and then quantize it to its nearest guy. And then you just go on like that. So it's in a raster order. You get something like this. Uh, get a hold of the, the, uh, the notes and take a look at it uh, because, in fact, that, that looks quite good. Uh, but it's not as good as that. There, there's, there's, some, there's noise that you can see in there. Uh, now, you can, you can do better. You can, that, you can do a two-pass, where the first pass, you figure out which cells you want to actually use at, at a variety of different depths. And without dithering, it actually looks pretty good there. On this side, with dithering, it looks really good. And, uh, and we can also apply similar techniques to do segmentation. So you can do color segmentation by just, in this case, you don't want fidelity. You want, you want to trash the image, right? And you want to just sort of get a, an idea of what's, what is in there. So this is one where we just said, OK, let's, let's use two colors. Uh, in that case, three. Um, there's five. There's six. So uh, this, this That may be the best, <laughs> the two may be the best one for the segmentation there. But anyways, um, OK. And there are all a bunch of extras in the Leptonica library that, that there's just a few of the extras that in case you're not interested in anything you saw there. OK, so thanks.